Today, we are watching Matt Pat's Game Theory. Let's just get right into it. Ah! Yeah, it's it nuts. Huge. This thing towers over any video project we have ever done endless. on the channel. Endless, endless. But when you look at the totality of this franchise, the story of FNAF really boils Let me just put this in perspective. I've been doing content for about two years and done so many FNAF videos, and I swear some of the content just goes over my head because it's so it much information. The story of one man, William Afton. His successes, his failures, okay. his rise to becoming co-owner of one of the most successful <sighs> franchises William in the Afton. world, and his eventual fall to the monsters he mm -hmm. helped to create, mm -hmm. only to then be reborn in his eventual fall to the... All right, guys, this picture is actually from Pizza Simulator when he... Monsters Gets it burned, cooked up. Create, only to then be reborn in a new digital form later. That's Let's why I've go. decided to split this timeline into three main chunks. The okay. Foundation of Freddy's, how the business okay. started and how it came into being. The like Afton it? era, William's okay. decades long murder spree, and post Purple Guy. Basically modern FNAF. Everything yeah, that yeah, happens okay. after the pizzeria simulator. Mm -hmm. fight. And because there are lots of new big revelations in this thing that seemingly come out of nowhere, <laughs> as well as just points I want to talk about further, I decided to dedicate mm -hmm. one episode to each chunk. I I originally wow, wanted this guy's it to be going crazy. one seamless continuous video, but it just felt incomplete without some sort of explanation at the end of each one. Once this whole thing's done, I promise I'm going to merge all the narrative bits into one massive video so you can just skip my explanations. But for now, this just felt like the best, most satisfying, most complete way to do this. That being said, this is still about the story, the broad strokes of the franchise. So in order to make sure that you guys know that I'm not just pulling answers out of thin air, not only am I discussing some of the more controversial bits at the end of each chunk, we're also putting in a handy little graphic in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, which will show thumbnails, video titles, books, and any other citations that we need throughout the video so if you wish to understand that specific statement in more detail you know exactly where we've taken it from. what book is that this five nights of freddy fazbear fright summer five i've never seen this cover of this book details for yourself so Looks sit sick. back grab some popcorn or your pitchforks if you're the type to get upset when i say something controversial and make sure that you subscribe since this is going to be a video that you're going to want to come back to a few times in order to fully dissect without any more waiting i present to you the story of a loving obsessive father this is great descended into both get to learn fnaf ways, together let's go secret to eternal life okay finally dang it's been three minutes or even in the 1970s, but all the way back in the 1930s. It was the okay. throes of the Great Depression. And bro, what is this picture, bro? Is this William Afton? People were in desperate need of cheap entertainment, especially okay. in Utah, one of the states hit hardest, fourth highest unemployment in the nation, and full of transients. Mm -hmm. People looking for work in Salt Lake, find. Dude, this guy has some big words, full of transients. This sounds like Goku's like final Moving form. And ultimately moving out to find their fortunes out in California. People were tired and they were hungry. But as they traveled, Dang, there was one true. thing that could lift their spirits. A simple roadside attraction called Fred Bear's Singing Show. The ads were what? There's no way this is real. Fred Bear's Singing Show is going to help the Great Depression. Bro. We're plastered all over town, featuring an animated bear drawn in the popular pie-eyed cartoon style. What is this? Here was I've... cartoons like Mickey Mouse, Felix the Cat, Betty Boop. It immediately said that this, Fred Bear's, was a place where you could bring the family. And the price, honestly, couldn't be beat. For 50 cents, you could get food and entertainment as you watched <sighs> the local trained real-life dancing bear perform on stage. Normally, wow. you only got to see dancing bears at large traveling circuses like Barnum and Bailey, where the tickets would go for about a dollar. That's a dollar without food. But this was a smaller show, like the type for... Bro, dollar. <sighs> I see those hot dogs, and all I think is Costco. <laughs> Cause Costco keeps the cost low. Just a mere fifty cents. Watching that bear do tricks on stage brought a glimmer of joy at a time when so much was wrong. I love Matt Pat's editing, bro. Classic. Happiness to hundreds of travelers passing through looking for a quick meal, but it left a permanent impression on one little boy, capturing his imagination in a way oh. that nothing else had. One little boy named Billy. Ooh. That was his nickname, at least. But his Billy. parents like called him William. William Afton. The bear could dance. It could sing. For decades, William. William as a baby, bro. Dreamed of recreating the moment, bringing the musical bear to life. Baby but purple he guy. Smart, without a doubt, and he had a keen mind for okay. business, but he wasn't the most creative. How do you make a singing, dancing bear come to life? The best he could do was using rudimentary costumes. William was inspired by the work of Walt Disney, who throughout the 50s and 60s was pioneering the use of I've never seen this. throughout his theme park. The big innovation: suits with five fingers. This allowed the Ooh. performers wearing the suits to use their natural arms and hands to interact with the guests, as opposed to the older models where the arms would just hang. Bro, I'm not gonna lie. Those costumes are creepy. They creep me out. Like I wouldn't want to go with them. Simply by their sides. Finally, with a simple mascot suit, he would be able to realize his childhood dream. He would be able to bring Fred Bear to life. To appeal to the kids, and for copyright reasons, he changed Fred Bear from a realistic brown animal to a cartoonish yellow bear with a purple hat and bow tie. But feeling like one character wasn't enough, he added another friend, a yellow rabbit with a purple vest and matching tie named Bonnie the Bunny. While Fred Bear was certainly his first love, Bonnie was extra special because that was his. It was an original character that he had created from scratch. And I do mean scratch. 
scratch. William's hand sewn costumes were rough with seams Ew. and stitches visibly showing, but it was the best that he could do. And you know what? It was just enough. Bonnie and Fred Bear would perform on stage to small but enthusiastic crowds. Finally, he was able to deliver fantasy and fun to all the kids, delighting and inspiring them in the exact way that he had been delighted and inspired so many years ago. And things could have ended there. That could have been the end to his story. It could have been perfect had it not been for one thing. Other people saw the success of his idea and they wanted in. Enter Chica's Party World, a rival restaurant starring performing animal characters. Bro, idea, what? Except they did it better. William may have been the first, but obviously he wasn't the best. It hurt the prideful William Afton to Is this real? This restaurant was able to do the thing that he always Chica's to do, Party World. actually come to life. All the performers in this restaurant were robots, simple metal skeletons that were powered by battery packs. But all the of endos. Would turn and talk and dance on their own, no human required. It was like magic. Magic that came from the mind of a brilliant creator named Henry Emily. This Henry, in some small way, had been able to harness the power of life itself. Afton admired him. He was jealous, to be sure, but he also looked upon this man with awe. Off to one side of Chica's party world was a small cabaret stage Bro. featuring elephant magician. Is that Bubba Bubba Fett? Bubba, Bubba, Fett, Bubba Fett, Bubba Fett, Bubba Fett. more of a joke for the parents, but it was the main stage that was for the kids. A rocking band of characters featuring a yellow chicken thing with a southern drawl named Chica, backed by a band no of other themed characters, including a pig with a banjo, an upbeat what? frog from the local swimming hole, and a brown bear with a heavy southern accent. Wait, a bear? But bears were his Whoa. animals. Why not a cow or a horse? Something to fit the country theme a bit better. Why did it have to be a bear? And adding insult to injury, they had the nerve to call this thing Ned Bear, a direct copy of of his own Fred Bear. Whoops, that's gonna leave a mark. No, that was not okay. Afton's jealous admiration turned to hardened bitterness. A bitterness that would only grow over the next couple of years as families continued to choose Chica's party world over Fred Bear's. William bro, this is like literally Krusty Krab and Plankton, bro. Literally, like this is Plankton. This, this is literally Plankton's story. This couldn't compete with the appeal of the robots. Eventually, his restaurant would go bankrupt, only to get bailed out by, of course, Henry Emily. Another insult, another humiliation that William wouldn't soon forget. 1979. Despite okay. being bitter, Afton couldn't deny that what came next was a period of massive success and expansion. With the two franchises now merged into one, it was the best of both worlds. Afton's wow. ideas with Henry's robotic expertise. The two men decided to launch a interesting new family diner, a pizza chain that would eventually come to feed. Wait, wait. <laughs> Henry owned, wait, wait, Henry owned Chica Party World? Expertise. The two men decided to launch under a new name, Fred Bear's Family Diner, a pizza chain wow. that would eventually come to feature a mix of humans in performing suits as well as on stage animatronics. They decided to stick with Fred Bear as the headliner, considering the Yellow Bear was easily identifiable as a brand. There's no way, bro. Original performer that I did not know this. That. That's this crazy. This is deep. A mix of characters as the two so deep. Merged into one, with Pig Patch and Happy Frog performing right alongside Fred Bear and Bonnie. And as part of this one big Fred Bear family. Did I swear on everything? I've never Pig seen this pig. I've never seen that pig, bro. Frog performing right alongside Fred Bear and Bonnie. And as part of this one big Fred Bear family, they even got themselves official merch that were released, ranging from masks to magnets. The crappy Mr. Hippo fridge magnet? I am sorry. There's so many That's characters, it, not bro. All the characters were winners. The reception to some characters was just mediocre. So they faded away into the dumpster, storage units, and retro budget tech stores of lost nostalgia. Waiting for Mr. Hippo! To step back into the limelight if and when a headliner went out of commission. Others, though, would fare much better. Like a new pirate fox as well as a foxy! Playing variant of the yellow Bonnie Bunny. Ultimately, the franchise Bonnie. was so big it would spawn its own cartoon show, Fred Bear and Friends. Business was booming. In the end, Dang. Fred Bear and Bonnie's popularity would be so strong that they would be able to support the Fred Bear's Family Diner franchise all on their own, while also spinning off a new sister location dedicated to their friends. In 1983, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza launched, giving a dedicated home to all this new supporting cast of characters: Chica the Chicken, Bonnie the Blue Bunny, Foxy. Bro, this is literally the such dumbed down. There's so much more complexities in this story. It's actually crazy how well he did a good job on this. The pirate and of course the headliner. Props, bro. Freddy Fazbear. Business was good. And Insane. Was happy, mostly. It did bother him that the one original character that he created, the one that he himself mm. played, Golden Bonnie, got passed over for inclusion in that cartoon show. The only character in the roster of regulars to get ignored for the show. But okay. other than that, things were going smoothly. He had himself a wife, two sons. Purple girl, bro. I can't. A daughter. He had a thriving business. And best of all, he was able to learn the craft of robotics from the man that he both loved and hated, Henry. Together, they were constantly pushing the limits of what these characters could do. Because it was quick and easy, new characters introduced into the roster would be given a simple hand-sewn suit with five fingers that any performer could wear. Eventually, Henry would design one of his signature animatronics for that character, <laughs> utilizing a divided mouth with either a hinged or sliding jaw design. This was the first generation of animatronics. But why stop there? Afton had big ideas. What if the animatronics weren't just locked to the stage, but could freely roam the restaurant and interact with the kids? What if his mascot suits could become animatronics? What if you could use more than just rigid metallic skeletons. Why not experiment with tubes and wires that would give the animatronics fluidity and flexibility while still providing structure? 
structure. The possibilities for this technology were endless. Afton fell in love with robotics. He had started with a dream of bringing one simple singing bear to life, but with robots, hmm. he had stumbled across the tools that gave him the ability to control life itself. And thanks to Henry, he was practically speed running his way to an engineering degree. And while William wouldn't admit it out loud, one other thing that kept... I love that he doesn't go into in depth because then it gets confusing, right? Pushing him forward was the desire to beat his former rival, to prove himself smarter and more capable, to surpass the man who everyone else considered to be a visionary genius. But pride cometh before the fall, and tragedy was about to strike. Okay, so that brings us to the end of part one of the story. That said, at the end of each of these chunks, I want to break down some of the logical leaps that I made since the more narrative format doesn't give me much of a chance to justify a lot of the big decisions. And admittedly, there are some large leaps in here. Let's just start off with Fred yeah, Bear's show, shall we? We know, based on the retro poster that was hidden in Security Breach, that at least at one point, Fred Bear was an actual bear. And like I called out in that narrative segment, dancing bear shows were a real form of entertainment. The only problem is that, timing-wise, none of our main characters would be the people in charge of that business in the 30s and a series of pizza restaurants in the 80s without him just being extremely old. Best case scenario, if Afton's running the singing show when he's 18, that still puts him at nearly 70 when the first pizzeria opens and his murder spree begins. <laughs> of logical sense because he doesn't become immortal until his first death in spring trap. That's why I suspect that Fred Bear's singing show was either a family business that Afton mm -hmm. carried on to a new generation or okay. something that he saw as a kid and just wanted to recreate when he grew up. The Fred Bear singing show thing also starts laying the groundwork for some of the core elements of the story. That Freddy's was a place of fantasy and fun and that Afton, despite eventually mm -hmm. falling to become the heartless serial killer and mad scientist that we know him as, began as someone with good intentions and a love of entertaining kids. He wanted to bring things to life from the very beginning, a theme that recurs a lot for him throughout the rest of the franchise. Next up, let's talk about those mascot costumes. One thing that I keep going back to is the design of Glitch Trap. It's a handcrafted suit. You can see the seams and everything. It even has five... Yeah, dude, that's... Honestly, I think this is the creepiest costume for sure, dude. Look at that. Imagine that. Did you waking up and you seeing that in your bed? Fingers for the performer's hands. It is very much not... So creepy. Suit. This is something much more rudimentary. It came at a time before animatronics were a part of the story. That Okay, well, Chica's kind of creepy too, but... I suspect that it was actually the first, predating literally everything. It's also a suit that is very personal to Afton. He put his digital consciousness in that form. It's his personal avatar. It's the way that he sees himself. There's also a whole separate discussion to be had here about the habits and rituals of serial killers. So the fact that he's choosing to lure kids and kill them in this particular suit... Dude, you can't tell me it's not creepy. Come here. So while Red Bear <laughs> seems to have started as someone else's creation, Golden Bonnie was uniquely Williams, giving him a personal connection. And that's not all. In this whole franchise, only one set of characters have themselves five fingers. The nightmares. Even Golden Freddy, Fredbear, was a five fingered wearable suit at one point in the story, as we see in this shot from the graphic novel, before he, like everyone else, was turned into an animatronic. This seems to imply that all huh? of the main characters had similar wearable mascot outfits at least at one point in time, and that whoever is having the FNAF 4 nightmares, if they even are nightmares, something that we'll touch on in part two, saw those mascot suits specifically. Lastly, we have to talk about the elephant in the room the literal elephant, Orville Elephant, as well as the rest Who? of the mediocre melody. Bro, Orville Elephant. For a while now, I've suspected that the mediocre melodies played a much more. Bro, be, uh, are they from? Oh, they're from FNAF World, bro. Uh, aren't they? They have to be. Story than just being a bunch more I mean, obviously, obviously, right? Especially Ned Bear, which is just so suspiciously close to Fred Bear. And yet there are two. See, this is the stuff that makes my brain hurt, dude. I just can't keep up. How do you guys do this, dude? I can't. Two key details that we're going to have to justify with any mediocre melodies mention. One, they're very rudimentary with external battery packs, implying that they come very early in the timeline. And two, we know that at minimum, Mr. Hippo does eventually become an official member of the extended Freddy verse. But if these things are supposed to be cheap, generic ripoffs, why would you be trying to rip off your Self. You wouldn't. You would be stealing someone else's ideas. So if Afton created Fredbear, there would have to be some rival franchise. The only other person who would likely be ripping him off? Henry. We've talked extensively Henry. about how the mediocre melodies are clearly Henry's design aesthetic. So it just has to be him. I don't think Henry's doing this maliciously. He doesn't strike me as the type. He was likely building the robots at the orders of someone else that was running a rival. Bro, what is this hat? Is a spring hat? Restaurant <laughs> franchise. But that's enough motivation to start Afton down a path of jealous rivalry, but also begrudging admiration. As the Freddy Files Ultimate Edition says, it's important to revisit the beginning of Henry and William's relationship, so here you go. I think this is where it begins. Also, this is future Matt Pat here coming back to add this one in. Seems like the recently released character encyclopedia has backed up all of this speculation. I've had this timeline written for about a month now, but I've also been holding off a bit to see what wrenches this character encyclopedia might throw into it. And on this particular point, I gotta say, it seems hmm. like we might actually have nailed it. They actively call out the suspicious similarities to the main Fredbear crew. Quote from one of the pages, Ned Bear looks like an imitation, altered just enough to avoid copyright issues. I don't know about you, but that seems to imply that we were right on the money. Knowing all of this, at one point, the franchises had to have merged. That's really the only way that you get Mr. Hippo from the rival franchise as part of the Fazbear crew. This also mirrors a lot of what happened in the real-life history of Chuck E. Cheese with two rival restaurants, each with their own... What am I watching? What is this, bro? Chuck E. Cheese, Jasper T. Jowls. Bro, this guy? Oh my gosh, looks so... 
Pasquale, Helen Henry, Henry, Mr. Munch, Krusty, Crust, Krusty the Cat. Bro, what? Medang oink oink, Foxy Colleen. Bro, who's Sally's? Sally Sashay. <laughs> Bro, do it. What am I looking at? Characters merging to become one unified. Oh brand. man, yeah, we've gone into that in detail with other videos. Just wanted to remind you all. Of Bro, that here. Oh. I gotta make a video on those characters. What am Why I looking at? Why would I call at? out the rival restaurant as being named Chica's Party World? Few things, actually. First, we know for a fact that a location named Chica's Party World exists. It is mentioned in the source code teasing sister location. So it is out there somewhere and doesn't fit cleanly anywhere. Second, in the story of the puppet carver, Chica is very explicitly looped in with the book versions of Pigpatch and Ned Bear, implying that she started as a mediocre melody. Thirdly, her design just fits better with the theme of down-home country animals with southern accents playing the banjo and eat. You know what? Chica could probably have a southern accent. With Bibbs. And with her being the headliner of the show with her name on the restaurant, it would make sense then that when the restaurants merged, she was the one that was added to the main cast of characters while all the other mediocres faded away. It's also why when Freddy's closes after William's killing spree, she's the one to branch back off into her old franchise and is therefore missing in sister location. A detail that's bothered me okay. for years at this point. It might also explain why William decided to stuff his first dead kid into Chica. That one was Henry's creation, not his. Is all mm. this a big leap? Yeah. Is it connecting mm. a lot of dots that are very spread out across the franchise that have been holding on in the back of my mind for years absolutely but i think it makes sense it also serves as a clean answer to a lot of the random threads that scott's been leaving dangling for years so if you guys want more reactions more videos drop a like and i'll see you guys in the next one